السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ ان الحمد للہ نحمد و نست و نست و نؤمن به و نتوکل علیہ و نعود بالله من شہور انفسنا و من سیئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مدل له ومن يدلله فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي اهلا وسهلا في the next session of the seera of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam alhamdulillah so far we have completed uh, 30 weeks of the series on the seera of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam let us take a recap on the previous session that we had last week we addressed the after effects of the battle of badr and now it was proved that the muslims have a legitimate political presence not the way they were persecuted and tortured when they were in makkah then the greatest single sh- uh, shock for the quraysh which they never ever imagined they had absolutely no concept that these muslims had any potential of victory they took it for granted that they would win and the people who died the mushriks who died in the battle of badr many of them were of the elite of the quraysh and then this was another introduction for the internal treachery which within manina madina and there were two fronts that we have to see one is the munafiqs and the second is the jews as we will see when we proceed to, uh, in the sira now we then looked into the casualties among the quraysh how the bodies of the quraysh the mushriks were disposed and then we also looked into how a shaheed is buried what are the conditions of this particular thing and further on what we did was we looked into the prophets address to the quraysh who were already dead and we looked into the opinion of the scholars there were two schools of thought we looked into each of them and then we also tried to see how we we should approach these things not from our personal thinking but from a much much broader view that we have to look into that and then we came to the makkan response to defeat how did they respond to the defeat and next regarding the captives that were taken by the muslims now some of the makkan captives with special reference to abul as ibn arabi who was the husband of the uh, prophet's daughter zainab then we looked into the fiqh and sharia issues that can be derived regarding the marriage of zainab and abul as uh in this consideration i would like to make a correction from uh, in the previous sira that session that we had can i have this slide please uh by mistake i had put there abul as al arabi i had instead of husband i had put wife there my very sincere apologies i would like to stand corrected so kindly note that it was not wife there which you may see in the previous session it is the husband jazakum allah khair we'll proceed to the next slide now some of the people who came to madina from makka to pay ransom to release the makkan prisoners who were held captive now let us look into a couple of couple more of them one is al nadir ibn al harith now this man he was before islam could come he was the one who lived uh, lived in a place called al hira which was the capital of the laknid dynasty in iraq 
So he had a different exposure. He had a different uh, outside education. Now, Ibn Ishaq said that this man was of the shaitan of the Quraysh. Just like it is said that Abu Jahl was the Fir'aun of the Quraysh. Look at the two connections here. And I would like you to recall the incident where the shaitan, he accompanied the army of the Quraysh for the battle of Badr, and at the last moment, he ran away. Because he said he saw angels coming in to attack. And what did he say? He said he feared Allah. Listen to the words. He feared Allah. Now, try to imagine his fear of Allah when he knew fully well the punishment he would be facing in the Akhirah. It's very difficult to visualize that even for the shaitan to be afraid of Allah. He having known and having worshipped Allah for a long, long time, he realized the punishment of Allah, but he did not realize the Rahma of Allah. It's a lesson for us that whenever people tend to do something bad, they just don't fear the consequences. They don't fear Allah at all. The shaitan instigates them to do it, but the shaitan himself is afraid of Allah. Subhanallah. Now, it is said that eight ayahs about uh, eight ayahs in the Quran were revealed about this man, Al Nadir ibn al Harith. He became the most sarcastic commentator of the Quran. What would he say? What are those fables and stories? I can give you better fables. I can tell you better stories. These are all not the truth. When the people would come around the Prophet wasallam to listen to him while he was reciting the Quran, he would come and say, hey, leave this man. I can tell you better stories. He would call to him and start narrating stories of the ancient Persian kings. Look at his attitude. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in the Quran, if you go to Surat Al-Anfal, Surah number 8, Ayah number 31, the interpretation reads, and when our ayahs, that's the Quran, are recited to them, they say, we have heard this. That is the Quran. If we wish, we can say something like this. This is nothing but the tales of the ancients. Then in Surah Al-Furqan, Surah number 25, Ayah number 5, the interpretation reads, and they say, tales of the ancients, which he has written down, and they are dictated to him morning and afternoon. Again, in Surah Al-An'am, Surah number 6, Ayah number 93, the interpretation reads, and who can be more unjust than he who invents a lie against Allah or says, I have received inspiration, whereas he is not inspired in anything. And who says, I will reveal the like of what Allah has revealed. And if you could but see when the Zalimun are in the agonies of death, while the angels are stretching forth their hands, and what are the angels saying? Deliver your souls. This day you shall be recompensed with the torment of degradation because of what you used to utter against Allah, other than the truth. And you used to reject his ayah with disrespect. Look at the response. Also, Al Nadr and Uqba, they were the ones who decided to travel from uh, Makkah to Yathrib to ask the Jews to tell the, uh, ask the Prophet Sallallahu some very tricky questions and hoping to trap the Prophet Sallallahu They used to pick up some hints from the Jews, come to Makkah and put these questions forward to the Prophet Sallallahu Alhamdulillah, the Prophet ﷺ answered all their questions without hesitation, of course, with the help of Allah. 
Now we look at the, some of the captives who were released without paying ransom. Now, for those who could not accept, uh, afford any ransom, and they were also illiterate, they could not teach anybody, they were all sent back without any ransom. Some examples are Al-Muttalib ibn Hantab, Safi, uh, Saifi ibn Abi Rifaya, Abu Azza, Al-Jumahi, etc. Now, this shows the pragmatism of the Prophet it is said that Abu Azza was set to be free by the Prophet Sallallahu under one condition. He said, go back and never fight against us. Abu Azza agreed to this. He went back to Makkah and he wrote a beautiful poem which is recorded in Ibn Ishaq where he praised the generosity of the Prophet Sallallahu Many of the prisoners of Badr eventually accepted Islam. Some of them, Nawfal ibn al-Harith, al-Abbas, Akhil ibn Abi Talib, Suhail ibn al-Amir. Now, this shows the wisdom that while you have to be strict in one case, you also have to show mercy as a general rule. Now, we come to the spoils of war. Now, after the Muslims had chased the Quraysh away from Badr, the group of Muslims that remained behind had gathered all the spoils of war, all that the enemy had left back. In the times of Jahiliya, that is pre-Islamic times, the concept was whoever that takes it, it is theirs. Who doesn't take it is a loser. You take whatever you want and it becomes yours. Now, here the companions of the Prophet ﷺ began to argue regarding the distribution of the spoils they had collected. The debate was quelled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you go to the very first ayah of Surah Al-Anfal, Surah number 8, ayah number 1, they ask you about the spoils of war. It is addressed to the Prophet ﷺ. Say, the spoils are for Allah and the messenger. So fear Allah and adjust all matters of difference among you and obey Allah and his messenger if you are believers. The companions immediately returns the spoils to the Prophet who distributes to them before the army makes its way back to Medina. Now, how is this to be distributed? The same Surah Al-Anfal, Surah number 8, Ayah number 41, interpretation reads, I know that whatever war booty that you may gain, verily, one-fifth of it is assigned to Allah and to the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and to the near relatives of the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then to the orphans, the masakin, the poor, and the wayfarer. If you have believed in Allah and in that which we sent down to our slave on the day of criterion, that is criterion to know between the right and wrong, the day when two forces met, this is referred to the Battle of Badr, and Allah is able to do all things. Now, this one fifth of the spoils would be set aside like a government fund that could be used for the affairs of the state and it could be used by the Prophet ﷺ for the expenses of his home and family since he didn't have time to earn for himself. He was not able to do any business at all. And the Prophet ﷺ used to use this money to take care of the poor and needy people. Also, we know that the Prophet ﷺ and his family were not permitted to accept zakat. As for the rest of the spoils, the four-fifths, they were equally distributed amongst all those who participated in the Battle of Badr. Now, there's a famous uh, hadith, part of which uh, reads as under, the Prophet ﷺ said, 
I was given five things that no prophet before me was ever given. The spoils of war were made permissible to me, and they were not made permissible for any of the prophets that came before me. And similarly, the entire earth was made a place of prayer and purification. Purification how? The permission of Tayammum. The Prophet ﷺ specifically used to go out of his way to remind his companions and to advise them to distribute as much of the spoils of war to the needy and to the family members of the poor and who are in need. Why was this? Just to make sure that this would not pollute their intentions. Subhanallah, what a beautiful way to advise them. While the, um, while the spoils of war belong to you, make sure you help others also with the same thing. Can we have the next slide, please? Uh, we are going to a couple of small incidents that took place. First, we will go to Ghazatu Banu Sulaim. Now, in the month of Shawwal, the Prophet ﷺ received information that this Banu Sulaim was also considering some opportunities to attack the Muslims in Medina. So the Prophet ﷺ, along with a group of Sahaba, he went in the direction of this particular tribe. They reached a place called Al-Khudr, which was very near Banu Sulaim. And they camped there for about three days or a week or so by a stream nearby. It was just a warning to them not to try any tricks to attack the Muslims. Now, without engaging into any type of fighting or conflict, the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba returned to the city of Madina. Nothing took place. There was no fight or any such thing that took place. Now, the next we are talking about is Ghazwatu Sabiq. Uh, this is important. It's also known by the scholars as Ghazwatu Karkarat ul Khudr. Now, how did this take place? Abu Sufyan, who was now a leader of the Quraysh since Abu Jahl was killed, he took an oath. What was the oath? I swear I will not take a bath of purification until I have launched an attack against Muhammad to avenge the losses of Badr. In the month of Dhul Hijjah, he took 200 men with horses and set out until he came to a place near a mountain called Thaybun, which is about uh, half a day's journey outside of Medina. When night settled in, Abu Sufyan went into the city of Medina to Banu Nadir, which is a Jewish tribe, one of the three Jewish tribes who had made a pact with the Prophet Now, Abu Sufyan went to one of the leaders. His name was Sallam ibn Mishkam. He told him the purpose of his mission. He said, I'm here to extract some form of revenge against Muhammad and the Muslims. Now, this man, Salam, this leader, knowing fully well there was a pact between the Muslims and the Jews, he still collaborated with Abu Sufyan. They went to a part in Medina, which is called Urair, which is a valley where there was a huge orchard of date palm trees that belonged to Muslims. And this orchard was a source of sustenance for them. There was an Ansar, and along with the Ansar, another man who was there, though not a Muslim, he was an ally of Muslims. Both of them were looking after this orchard. Abu Sufyan and his group went to this orchard and set the trees on fire. While they were trying to burn down the entire orchard, they these two men who were looking after the orchard rushed towards them. They were murdered. They were murdered because they opposed. And after murdering these two people, Abu Sufyan and his group quietly ran away from Madina. They realized that these actions which they had taken could turn out very badly for them. 
the prophet sallallahu found out about this he immediately gathered a group of sahaba he put abu lubaba in charge of madina and he rode out in pursuit of abu sufyan and the 200 men the muslims reached a place called karkarat al khudr which i mentioned just now and found or follow them but then the muslims found a bunch of sabik which is known as wheat or barley which the Arabs usually grind into a fine powder and which they would carry during travel. It was supposed to contain a lot of proteins. Along with that, there were other goods and also food which Abu Sufyan and his people had left behind while they were fleeing. This is one of the reasons why this particular ghazwa is also known as Ghazwatul Sabiq. I've written there as barley. The Prophet authorize the Sahaba to lay claim on this, saying that these are from the blessings of Allah. And then the Muslims returned to Medina. Here also there was no conflict as such. Another one was Ghazwat, Ghazatud Dhi Amar. Let's see what this was. Now, Banu Talaba of Ghaftan, that is an area in the northern region, were also gathering an army together to launch an attack against the Muslims. The Prophet ﷺ got to know of this. He gathered a group of 400 Sahaba and set out in the direction of Ghaftan. And now this time, the Prophet ﷺ placed Uthman bin Afan anhu, in charge of the city of Medina. It so happened that on the way, there was very heavy rain. The Prophet ﷺ was completely soaked. He changed into dry clothes and hung the wet clothes on a tree to dry. Along with that, he put a sword also. And then he lay down under the tree to take some rest. One of the mushrikun was told by his buddies, his friends, to go and threaten the Prophet ﷺ. What happened? This man went near the Prophet, drew the Prophet's sword from the tree and told the Prophet wasallam, Ya Muhammad, who will protect you from me today? The Prophet wasallam was defenseless at that time. What did he say? He said, he responded, he said, Allah will take care of me. Now, actually, there are two narrations to this effect. Ibn Kathir mentions a later narration in another campaign, which had similar events, but this ca campaign had a very unique thing. The Prophet Wasallam, the moment he said, Allah is protecting me, Jibreel Salam came down and shoved this Gawrat Ibn al-Harith on his chest. He just pushed him. He went flying and fell down on his back. The sword came free from his hand. The Prophet ﷺ got up, picked up the sword, and then asked him, who is going to defend you from me? You asked me, who would defend me from you? I said, Allah. And Allah sent Jibreel. Now, who is going to defend you? This man said, no one. And I bear witness that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that you are his messenger. And I swear to Allah that I would never dare attack you again. I will not stand with the people that are against you. He went back to his friends who were watching the entire episode from a distance. They asked, what happened? What did you do? He said, I, I saw a huge man appear in front of me who shoved me in the chest. He did it so hard that I flew back and I landed on my back. And I recognized the fact that had to be an angel. And I also recognized the fact that Muhammad وسلم, is the messenger of Allah. And an angel comes to his aid. I will never stand against him ever again. Not only did he become the first person to accept Islam from amongst uh, his people, but he became someone who would actively give dawah to his people. Now, an ayah was revealed on this. If you go to Suratul Maida, Surah 
the number five, ayah number 11, the interpretation reads, O oh, you who believe, remember the favor of Allah unto you when some people desired, they made a plan to stretch out their hands against you. But Allah would help their hands from you, so fear Allah. And in Allah, let believers put their trust. Can we have the next slide? Now we are going to talk of the nikah of Ali Rasulullah and who with Fatima Rasulullah and her, the daughter of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This was another major event that took place around the second year of Hijrah. And Fatima Rasulullah and her was the youngest daughter of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. At the time of Passing of her mother, Khadija Rasulullah Anha, Fatima Rasulullah Anha was still very young. So the Prophet raised her as a single father. Now, after a lot of hesitation, Ali Rasulullah Anhu approached the Prophet with a proposal. But he did not have the courage to express himself. The Prophet ﷺ knew what he had come for and he asked Ali Rasulullah do you have anything to offer her? What is the meher that you can give? What are your finances? What is it that you have? To each of these questions, Ali Rasulullah said nothing. He replied in the negative. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, what happened to that armor that I had given you? There was an armor called Khutamiya that the Prophet ﷺ had gifted to Ali Anhu from the Battle of Badr. Now, what is so special in this armor? It is very special because it was a sword breaker. No sword could ever cut into this armor. And any sword trying to attack this armor would get shattered. That was the strength of this armor. So, what happened? What was the meher? And then, how was the walima in arranged? The Prophet ﷺ said that armor is enough for the meher. Now, you go ahead and start preparing. And the Prophet ﷺ told Ali Anhu to figure out a couple of things. First is the walima. And the second is, how is he going to maintain the family? The Walima feast had to be done. And as we know, Ali Anhu did not have any money for that. So what did they do? The, some of the Sahaba got together and they helped him to offer a Walima to the community. Now Ali Anhu also wanted to make money to set up a home and make arrangements for having a family. Now, the advice that the Prophet ﷺ gave Ali Rasulullah and who was, why don't you get some idkhir from the woods? You can collect it from outside Medina and bring and sell it here. This idkhir was a type of a grass or a leaf which could be used for many different purposes, like uh, cooking food, and for fire, etc. Now, Ali was asked to make arrangements to earn his living so that he can take care of the family, even though he had nothing. Now, for the marriage, naturally, the consent of the girl has to be taken. It's absolutely necessary. No woman, no girl can be asked, are forced to get married. Now, how did the Prophet ﷺ approach his daughter, Fatima Rasulullah? He mentioned three qualities of Ali Rasulullah. Firstly, Ali Rasulullah was among the early believers. So he has seniority in Islam despite being so young when he accepted Islam. 
Secondly, Ali Razulatala Anhu has great knowledge and he is very intelligent. And lastly, Ali is the most vicious amongst the Sahaba, I mean virtuous, I'm sorry, virtuous amongst the Sahaba in patience. Fatima Razulatala Anha agreed to the marriage proposal. Now, what were the gifts given to Fatima Razulatala Anha by the Prophet? Please keep in mind, Ali had nothing with him. He gave Fatima Razulatala Anha several gifts, which are often uh, referred to as Tajhiz or Jihaz or Jahaz. He gave her a blanket. The length of the blanket was such that if both of them want to cover themselves with the blanket, it would not cover them fully. Some part of the body, either head or the legs, would be exposed. That was the size of the blanket given. Then a water skin to collect water, a bowl, a dish, and a pillow made out of leather and stuffed with the leaves of Iddikr. These were mostly the supplies that were made for the new home. Now, all of on the face of it all, this may look very simple and interesting. But from this, many fiqh and sharia issues, lessons have been taken. May Allah guide us in all aspects of marriage based on, based on a proper understanding of the sharia. Rather than having personal preferences, personal interests, etc. Amen. To the best of my knowledge, after the marriage, the Prophet ﷺ did not help Ali with anything during their life after that. It's only at the time of marriage that some essentials were given. Look at the way that we look into aspects. We quote this hadith. And then we start demanding, yes, from the girl's side, we want this. From the girl's side, we want this. Even though the, the boy's side are very well to do. May Allah guide us in this. And may Allah make us do, concentrate on doing things that would please Him only because we have to answer to Allah the consequences of all our deeds. Amin, Ya Rabbullah. Now we come to the tasbih of Fatima Razalatala. Most of you know about it. The married life took a very big toll on Fatima Razalatala and her and her children. She was struggling. And of course, many of you know how she struggled to manage the house. So Ali Razalatala and who told his wife, why don't you go to your father and request him to provide a servant to help you around the house? So Fatima Razalatala Anha went to pray Fajr and then she went to the house of the Prophet He was not there at that time. He was out on some errands. She returned to her house. But when the Prophet came home in the evening, Aisha Razalatala Anha told him, Fatima Razalatala Anha had come looking for you. So the Prophet went to the house of Fatima Razalatala Anha and after knowing the purpose that why she had gone to his house, the Prophet Sallallahu said, you want help and assistance? Let me tell you something better than help and assistance. Whenever you lay down for bed, before you go to sleep, say Subhanallah 33 times, say Alhamdulillah 33 times, and say Allahu Akbar 34 times. This is better for you than any help or assistance from a maid. Subhanallah. Ali Razilwal and who later narrated, I never quit doing that for the rest of my life. And I benefited by it. This is called the Tasbih of Fatima Razilwal uh, they had five children in total, Hassan, Hussein, Rasul Ram, uh, Muhassin, Umm Kulthum, and Zainab. That Muhsin he passed away while he was a child. And Fatima Rasulullah Anha named her two daughters after her sisters who had 
passed away. Now there's an incident. Ali Rasulullah and who and Fatima Rasulullah and her were fasting. One day when they sat down to break the fast, an orphan came to them saying, "Oh family of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I am an orphan. Help me." The couple gave their food to the orphan. They drank water and they slept hungry. The next time they sat down for breakfast on another day of fasting, a miskin, a poor person came and he said, O oh, family of Rasul, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I am a miskin, please help me. Here again, they gave whatever they had, they drank water and went to sleep. Another time would so happen, while they were sitting down to break their fast, a prisoner came and he asked for food. They did the same thing. But they did not tell anyone, they did not publicize that they broke the fast only with water. When the people to whom they gave the food came and tried to thank them, what did they say? We fed you for the sake of Allah. We don't want any type of a compensation from you. The ayah were revealed which I'm going to mention now, because of the deed that they had done. When they went to the Prophet wasallam, the Prophet wasallam congratulated them and he said, these ayah were revealed because of the deed that you had done. Which are these ayah? Surah Al-Insan, Surah number 76, ayah numbers 8 and 9. The interpretation reads, and they give food in spite of love for it to the needy, the orphan and the captive. Saying, we feed you only for the countenance of Allah. We wish not for, from you any reward or gratitude. SubhanAllah. Six months after the Prophet ﷺ passed away, in the beginning of the month of Ramadan, uh, some people, some narrations say the third of Ramadan, Fatima Rasulullah Anha passed away. At that time, she was about uh, 28 or 29 years old. Can we have the next slide, please? Now we come to a very major issue. This is the expulsion of Banu Khainukha. Banu Khainukha consisted, this is a Jewish tribe which was in Medina, one of the three Jewish tribes again, which had signed a pact of agreement with the Prophet ﷺ, they consisted of craftsmen and blacksmiths. And they had made a lot of armor. And it was known as the militarized Jewish colony in, the, in Medina. They were famous for all to determine the truth of what was going on and to avoid letting the Banu Khainukha think that they can do as they pleased. Okay, the Prophet ﷺ was suspicious that they had become hostile to the Muslims. As I said, they had signed a pact of allegiance, but them to invite them to Islam. How did they react? They scoffed at his offer and challenge the Muslims to a fight. Why? Because they were saddened at the loss of the Quraysh. And they did not want the Muslims to win at that time. It is clear that the Jews did not consider the Prophet ﷺ's covenant as binding upon them. Most of them, given the chance, would have preferred to go to the pagan idolaters rather than the Muslims. What did this tribe tell the Prophet Oh Muhammad, do not deceive yourself. You merely fought a party of Quraysh who were inexperienced at war. <clears throat> but if you want to fight us, then know that we are an entire people and indeed you have not met with anyone like us before. We are very strong. But then why did they threaten the Prophet ﷺ? One of the reasons was because their economy was going down. 
in order to facilitate their economy. Why? What the Prophet ﷺ had done was he had established his own market and here there were no taxes, there was no interest on the loans taken. As a result, what happened was the demand was more to the arrangement made by the Prophet ﷺ and this Banu Khainuka were no longer able to control the economy and also they were not be able to make those illicit profits. The Prophet Sallallahu's move was not a means to antagonize them, no, but was a further step towards alleviating the problems of the poor because there was a divide between the rich and the poor. The wealthy were becoming more wealthy and the poor were becoming more poor. This became a point of conflict between the Prophet ﷺ and the Banu Khainukha. Now, despite their obvious betrayal, the Prophet ﷺ ignored their threat. Now, we come to Surah Al-Imran, Surah number 3, Ayah numbers 12 to 13. I will just read the interpretation. Say, O Muhammad ﷺ, to those who disbelieve, you will be defeated and gathered together in hell. And worst indeed is that place to rest. There has already been a sign for you, referring to the Jews, in the two armies that met, that referring to battle of Badr. One was fighting in the cause of Allah. And as for the other, they were disbelievers. They, the disbelievers, saw them with their own eyes twice their number, although they were thrice their number. And Allah supports with his victory whom he pleases. Verily, in this is a lesson for those who understand. The same surah, Ayah 118, O you who believe, take not as your bitana, advisors, consultants, protectors, those outside your religion. That is, don't take the Jews, the Christians, and the hypocrites as your advisors, since they will not fail to do their best to corrupt you. They desire, they, they desire to harm you severely. Hatred has already appeared from their mouths. But what their breasts conceal is far worse. Indeed, we have made plain to you the ayah if you understand. The same surah, ayah number 120, if a good befalls you, it grieves them. But if some evil overtakes you, they rejoice at it. But if you remain patient and became, become the muttakun, that is the pious, not the least harm will, there come, will their cunning do to you. Surely Allah surrounds all that they do. Now, in this thing, we are going to make a reference to Kaab ibn Ashraf. After the defeat of the Quraysh at Badr, this uh, Ashraf, Kaab ibn Ashraf, who is the chief of the Jewish tribe of Nadir, he travels to Makkah and there he starts inciting the people against the Prophet ﷺ. Now, while in Madinah, Abdullah ibn Sallam, who was a rabbi who turned into a Muslim, he belonged to the Banu Qainukha, he informs the Prophet ﷺ of the plot that is being made now against the Muslim community in Madinah. And around the same time, the Prophet ﷺ gets guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you go to Surah Al-Anfal, Surah number 8, Ayah numbers 58 to 61, I'll just uh, read through the interpretation. If you, O Muhammad ﷺ, fear treachery from any people, throw back the covenant to them and in, on equal terms. Certainly, Allah likes not the treacherous. And let not those who believe think that they can outstrip the punishment. Verily, I'm sorry, let not those who disbelieve think that they can outstrip the punishment. Verily, they will never be able to save themselves from the punishment of Allah. 
and make ready against them all you can of power, including your steeds of war, to threaten the enemy of Allah and your enemy and others besides whom you may not know, but whom Allah does know. And whatever you shall spend in the cause of Allah shall be repaid to you and you shall not be treated unjustly. But if they incline to peace, you also incline to it. And trust Allah. Verily, He is the all-hearer. He is the all-knower. Now, in spite of all this, the tension was incre increasing. The growing hostility between Bani Qainukha and the Muslims reached a peak after a certain incident that took place in the marketplace. There was a scuffle between a Muslim helper, that's an Ansar, who came to defense of a woman who was being insulted by a Jewish merchant. She was being, being very badly insulted by this Jewish merchant. Now, this Muslim helper tries to come to her rescue and he kills this Jewish merchant. Now, the tribesmen of this Jew kill this Muslim. The companion suggests that the Prophet arbitrate the matter and try to cool the thing. But Khainukha refuses to abide by the terms of the peace or whatever is being agreed upon. And what they do is they start going and they lock themselves up in a garrison. It's a fort. They enter a fort and lock themselves inside. Now, with Hamza Rizal and Huba his side, the Prophet quickly, what he did was, he mobilized a brigade, a small army, and surrounded this Jewish fortress. And they laid siege by what no supplies were ever allowed to enter into the fortress. How long will the supplies last? Ultimately, Khainukha's leaders look for support from the existing alliance Khazraj, but nobody agrees to support them. And naturally, the supplies dwindle and they had to surrender. Now, what type of punishment did these people expect from the Prophet and the Muslims? After about a two-week standoff, no supplies were there for them. The Jewish tribe surrenders what did the Prophet ﷺ do? He ordered all the men to be gathered together and tied up. And he said, let's decide what to do with them. Now, I want you all to recall Abdullah ibn Ubay, the leader of the hypocrites and also the leader of the Khazraj. He goes to the Prophet ﷺ, grabs the neck of his coat and publicly demands that the Prophet ﷺ let these people go. But the Prophet ﷺ remains steadfast. He refuses. Now, as per the traditional punishment meted out in those days to traitors, what was expected by the Prophet ﷺ is, as per what used to happen before, they expected that all the men would be massacred and the women and children would be sold to slavery. And this Abdullah ibn Ubay, he came to the Prophet ﷺ and he set up a plea to the Prophet ﷺ. Please don't murder, kill the men. Please don't do this to the women. He asked for clemency to be, for these people to be spared. And then the Prophet ﷺ said he agreed, provided the entire tribe leaves Medina immediately. They should not be there at all. Allah had already instructed the Prophet ﷺ on how to deal with this betrayal of the Khainukha. If you go to Surah Al-Anfal, Surah number 8, Ayah number 57. So, if you gain the mastery over them in war, punish them severely in order to disperse those who are behind them so that they will learn a lesson. Can we go to the next slide, please? Now, what was the reaction? How did Hunaikha, uh, Khainukha take the news of the expulsion? 
they were banished from Medina, and ultimately they settled down in an oasis, which is called. Wad so after they left, they had left behind many many items, which they could not carry with them. Their houses were there, their belongings were there, the armors were there. All this were taken over by the Muslims. Again, in Surah Al-Maida, Surah number five, ayah numbers fifty-one to fifty-six. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the interpretation reads, O you who believe, take not the Jews and the Christians as awliya. They are but awliya to one another. And if any amongst you takes them as awliya, then surely he is one of them. Verily, Allah guides not those people who are zalimun. And you see those in whose hearts there is a disease, they hurry to their friendship saying, we fear lest some misfortune of a disaster may befall us. Perhaps Allah may bring a victory or a decision according to his will. Then they will become regretful for what they have been keeping as a secret in themselves. Now here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quotes Abdullah ibn Ubay when he says, we are worried about bad luck. So this ayah is directly referring to this. The next ayah says, and those who believe will say, are those the men who swore their strongest oaths by Allah that they were with you, the Muslims? Now this is referring to the hypocrites. All that they did has been in vain and they have become the losers. O oh, you who believe, whoever from among you turns back from his religion, Allah will bring a people whom he will love and they will love him. Humble towards the believers, stern towards the disbelievers, fighting in the way of Allah, fighting in the way of Allah. And never afraid of the blame of the people who blame. That is the grace of Allah, which he bestows on whom he wills. And Allah is all sufficient for his creatures' needs, all knower. And then, verily, your wali, please listen, your wali is Allah, his messenger and the believers, those who establish a salah and give zakat and those who bow down, sainukha. There's one word I would like to use here. The word, do not take the Jews and Christians as your awliya. Now, many of the interpretations, the translation mentioned as friends. It is not friends. And many people start attacking us because they quote this particular ayah and say, look, Allah himself says, don't, come, uh, don't take us as friends. The word is wrong. The interpretation is wrong. The awliya actually means advisors, protectors. You can be friends with the Jews and the Christians. Don't put all your personal secrets, all your thing, and seek protection from them and seek advice from them. This is what is meant. Not that you should not be friends with them. May Allah guide us to the right path. Amen. Now, the question arises, why did not the other Jewish tribes come to help Khainukha? The other two tribes are Al-Nadir and Khurayza. They did not attempt to help the Khainukha tribe. Because no doubt those tribes also were hostile to the Prophet ﷺ. But if you look at the way the Banu Khainukha took the action, it would never come anywhere near justice. The wrong that they had done was very clear cut. And even if this was put to a Jewish uh, jury, the Khainukha would not have succeeded. That is why they preferred to keep away. Now, what are the benefits of expelling them? This Khainukha were the largest of the three Jewish tribes and the first to be dealt with. It was the least harsh of the three later on how the other two were going to be punished. Now, again, the proper understanding of the ayah. 
between a friend and an audio. Don't take privilege of the Jews and the Christians for your personal benefit. For anything, just they are just as don't, a friend, not an advisor, and not as a guide or a protector. Aisha Rasulullah and her used to say, "Wallahi, the Prophet وسلم, never took revenge on for something personal." And this is exactly how the Prophet وسلم, dealt with that hypocrite, Abdullah ibn Ubay. Even though he was rude to the Prophet Sallallahu the Prophet Sallallahu did not retaliate in messaging. The Prophet Sallallahu always was having a hope that this man would accept Islam. Knowing fully well what a type of a person he is, still the Prophet Sallallahu had hope. On now, how did this, the question arises when this Abdullah Ibn Ubay came and pleaded to the Prophet for clemency to the people. How did the Prophet change his mind? No one knows. There is a clear wisdom in publicly granting Abdullah ibn Ubay what he wants. Like I said, there's still hope that he would become a genuine Muslim. Can you imagine this is during the second year of Hijrah? Barely a year and three months since the Prophet ﷺ had come. And it was at that time that this man, Abdullah ibn Ubay, was most respected figure before Islam had come there. And there were still many people in Medina who used to look up to him. So there is a wisdom behind the approach of the Prophet ﷺ. The true colors of the Munafiqun started showing now. Still, they are not called Munafiqun. Can you imagine? Yes, Nifaq happened after Badr. But then it manifested itself at the Battle of Uhud. Inshallah, from in the next series, we will go for the beginning of the Battle of Uhud, Inshallah. Can we... Go to the duas, please. Allahumma inni as'aluka sihhatan fi imanin fi imanin wa imanan fi husni khuluq wa salahan yatba'ahu najahun wa falahun. Next dua. Allahumma inna Na'uzu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan, wa na'uzu bika min al-adzi wal-kasal, wa na'uzu bika min al-jubni wal-bukal, wa na'uzu bika min ghalabat al-dayn wa khair al-rijal. Wa ufabbidu amri illa Allah, inna Allah basirun bil-ibad. Next please. Allahumma innaka afuun kareemun tuhibbul afu fa'afu anni. Jazakumullah khairan. Inshallah we will meet next week again. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.